uh, there are some whose behavior or their conduct reveals themselves as enemies of Christ. Mm. And one of my favorite scenes in the original Top Gun is when Tom Cruise sees Viper. You know, he's the best pilot there is out there. Played by... Um, Who is he played by? He's great. He's got Viper. a great mustache. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Salty Pastor Podcast, a podcast dedicated to helping you learn and grow in your faith. It is a journey that you must do on your own. It is not something we can do for you. However, we can come alongside you to challenge you, encourage you, and to tell some jokes along the way. My name is Jess Mayer. I will be your host, and we cannot do the Salty Pastor Podcast without a special guest. This week, it's Zach Peak, the one, the only, back from his great and wondrous trip to Peru. Hi. Please welcome Zach. <laughs> Just hi. Hi. This is all I got. <laughs> I almost hi died in Peru, but other than that, it was hi great. Hi in the yeah, elevation. Exactly. Hi, I'm happy yeah, to be here. Yeah. Um, just as a, as a quick aside, Jesse said it was a great wonder trip, which it was. Peru's beautiful. We were in the Andes Mountains. They have jungles at 8,000 feet with these massive mountains. It's amazing. Also, I got a rare form of altitude sickness and spent five days in the hospital, but I'm totally fine. I'm okay, but I and feel like Jesse was poking at that a little bit just so. a little bit <laughs> it was but still great we're glad you're safe and Thank you're you. back and we're glad you're here on the episode i gotta say i mean having you on 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 the podcast now after we've been doing our movie podcast i feel like chase should be here between us i and know we need chase enough. to throw and we're doing a movie in. as yeah. well so it feels like and it just naturally so for those of you who haven't found it yet the real stakes podcast r-e-e-l uh, features me, Zach, and Chase Nelson, one of our worship team members, talking about movies. And we talked about Top Gun Maverick most recently. If you're wanting to watch that on YouTube, it's not actually on the Foothills YouTube channel um, because we do review rated R movies. We decided to do its own channel so that we weren't promoting rated R movies on the church <laughs> <Good> YouTube <idea. laughs> channel. Um, so you can look that up on Real Stakes um, podcast on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. So wherever yep. you're listening to this now, you can also find that. So yeah. um, that's a quick shout out. But let's move on to what we're actually talking about today, which is movies on this which podcast. Is other, but what's funny and which is, is also, the last the last movie we did for Real Stake was Top Gun Maverick, which and, we decided was amazing. Yes, and um, as you heard on Tuesday with Pastor Doug, we're doing the original Top Gun for this yep. week's At The Movie series, where we're taking secular movies and then um, revealing spiritual truths that have been in the Bible for thousands of years that just happen to also play out in these movies in a way that sometimes is a little bit easier for us to relate to. So yeah. um, Pastor Doug reviewed all of the biblical studies on Tuesday's episode, mm -hmm. um, but... Today's we're going to do some application today yeah. on, on Top yep. Gun. So where are we starting today in our application process? Well, the spiritual application of Top Gun is that airplanes are cool. They are cool. That's pretty much also, it. We're done here. And we'll see you next week. And beach volleyball is cool. And beach volleyball. <laughs> beach volleyball is great. Beach volleyball is very cool. Uh, go move to San Diego because it's beautiful. But like, maybe don't play in jeans. <laughs> Or that is throw still, in a leather jacket that immediately is still so There was another movie podcast I was listening to where they were talking about the whole scene. They're like, he's in jeans? They're all in jeans. What are they doing? It's it's amazing. But uh, we're not, unfortunately, we're not talking about the volleyball scene either uh, today or on Sunday. Um, as much spirituality is in it, it just doesn't really fit with the yes, message. Yes, it so, doesn't quite. It's something for a different time and different a different vibes, topic. Different vibes. Uh, but what we are going to talk about today for the application, and we're going to talk about this a little bit on Sunday, but you know, Sunday is always a little bit of a combination between the Bible study and the application. We're going to talk about discipleship and community. Okay. And I, I personally believe, and the Bible has a lot of this, and it's just, you know, different parts of the Bible vibe with different people differently. If you relate to it differently, we all have our own relationship Especially with Christ. Especially in what part of life you're in, yeah, too. Yeah, exactly. That can, certain verses hit you way different mm -hmm. at certain points in your life. And one thing that really sticks out to me at this point in my life when I read the Bible is the um, focus on community and discipleship mm. and how that is really how we change the world. It's how we make an effect on the world as Christians. Uh, Jesus says that they will know you're my disciples. He's talking about the world when he says they, they will know you're my disciples by the way you love each other. And the way we love each other is not um, always playing beach volleyball together. It's yes. not. Uh, I mean, it's a great way. <laughs> it's a but. great way, but it's not the only way. But a lot of the, what it looks like is what the first century church looked like. Um, and, 
and so we're going to talk about a little bit about community, about the application of that. On Tuesday, uh, Pastor Peak talked about uh, Philippians chapter three, and it talked about maturity, right? Right. And one thing that I really like about that verse, which we're going to talk about in Top Gun, is in that section of passages, it says uh, there are some whose behavior or their conduct reveals themselves as enemies of Christ. Mm. And one of my favorite scenes in the original Top Gun is when Tom Cruise sees Viper. You know, he's the best pilot there is out there. Played by... Um, Who is he played by? He's great. He's got Viper. a great mustache. Yeah. I can't remember. I but love yes. how they don't even have his name. His name is just Viper. Just Viper. He has no other name according <laughs> to the, Viper. the credits even. I don't think even yeah. in the credits they list him as no, anything other than No, he's listed Viper. as Viper. Viper. That is it because yes. he's awesome. But he is out there flying, you know, missions and stuff and doing training at Top Gun. And Maverick sees him. Tom Cruise sees him. And he's supposed to stay with his wingman. He's supposed to protect him, help his wingman shoot the first plane down, and then go after Viper. But he sees Viper, and he gets really excited. Mm. And he's like, I'm going to go take him down. And so he flies out. He tries. To, he follows Viper. And even, you know, in the movie, in the scene, Viper's like, man, this kid's good. But then, because Viper was using his teammate correctly, as Tom Cruise is following Viper trying to shoot him down, uh, the teammate Jester comes in and kills Tom Cruise, you know, right. in the training exercise. And then afterwards, Iceman, you know, uh, Val Kilmer, Ted, what is it? Kazansky? What is Kazansky, it? yeah. Kazansky, which is really close to Kazansky, but we're, right. you know, it's <laughs> <laughs> not great timing on their part. Uh, nope. But he comes up to him and he's like, you know, whose side are you on? You're dangerous to your allies. You left your wingman. He gets shot down and then you're two on one and you get shot down. It's a bad decision. Mm. Whose side are you on? What does your conduct reveal? And I feel like those that scene in the movie, you know, when it shows that, you know, as talented and as skilled as Maverick is, he's reckless, you know, and he's making bad decisions that hurt his side. Right. You know, when Paul says in Philippians chapter three, what does your conduct reveal about you? You know, he says there are Christ, there are people who follow the way whose conduct reveals that they are enemies of Christ. Mm. And so I want to take that and I want to talk about community and discipleship today. Okay. You know, Okay. Yeah. What would, well, up? I mean, I just, I think it's probably one of the most underutilized skills that most churches kind of just gloss over. Yeah. I think, I mean, we put a lot of focus on it here at Foothills, but even then it's like not everyone who attends Foothills, not even everyone that listens to, to this podcast is in discipleship with someone, whether they are discipling someone or they have someone who's discipling them mm -hmm. or they're not in a small group um, experiencing life and community together. So I think it's one of our best tools, yeah. but it's one we kind of, whether our lives are, we just feel like our lives are too busy or, or you know, I've kind of got it figured out or what, you know, there's hundreds yeah. of excuses for why people choose not to engage in this. And it's a, one of the best tools we have in our arsenal to yeah. grow our strength, grow our faith and mm -hmm. to really be better yeah. In life, doing life together. Well, and, and what I'm going to say today is that everything you mentioned, discipling someone, being discipled, being in a small group. And then I would say also on top of that, the fourth one would be being part of a bigger community, which would be like Foothills is uh, that's what you should be doing. All of those. It's right. not just one. And then, yeah, it's time consuming. It takes some time, but we're going to talk about why it's so important. Um, and the first thing I would say about that is in Matthew uh, chapter 28. And it's funny because Harvey just used this verse and I'm going to use it again on Sunday. <laughs> it's the great commission, right? Right before Jesus leaves the disciples to go back to heaven. He says, you know, go and make disciples of all nations. And our mission as Christians is to expand his kingdom. It's to have a relationship with him. And out of that relationship with him, he moves through us to expand his kingdom, mm. to create love, to create peace, to create joy, you know, to create a church that is thriving and good. So that is our mission. Whether If you decide to follow Christ, that is the mission. That is the command he has given you. And so if you don't think that's a good mission, I will let you argue with him. I will not. <laughs> I will not, not try to step this in. Out. You, this is between you and Jesus. I'll just be like, look, Jesus said this, so that's between you and him. I'm just going to, if you think it's not right, I'm going to let you talk to him yes. about it. I do not want to get in the middle of that. <laughs> but if you hear those words and you're like, you know what? That's right. Because Jesus said that Jesus commanded that Jesus asked us to do that as part of our relationship with him, then, okay, that's a great first step to accept that. But now it's like, what do you do? And the first step is letting yourself be discipled. It's finding someone who is willing to meet with you. Uh, what I do right now is I disciple someone and we meet once a week. 
Mm. And we just meet once a week. It's every evening. It's for about an hour. Sometimes we go long. It's an hour and a half because we're buddies too. But, you know, that is what we do right now. And we find someone to disciple us. And that is such an important thing because when you're discipling someone, it's like, what is the best way to learn something? It's to teach it, right? Right. And so I have discipled people and I've learned just as much as they have. Mm. And it's an incredible thing that furthers your relationship with Christ. And it's so important to be involved in discipleship because that is how life change happens for us and for others. Not because we're doing it, but because God is working through that time with, that we have with those other people. Well, and I think in a world that's full of so many broken families these days of, I didn't have, you know, my personal story, I didn't have a father, right? Like I didn't have a father growing up. And so having a, a male discipleship partner who comes alongside me and says, here's some things you need to work on spiritually as a man that mm -hmm. would improve your walk is so huge because I never had that growing up. So there's yeah. key things I missed. And that's so common these days that it's mm -hmm. like, even if that wasn't the case, we need discipleship. Yeah. But now in this world that is constantly filled with broken homes and different ways of viewing mm -hmm. how you, you're supposed to be going through life, we need it almost even more than we ever have yeah. before, even when this commission was stated back um, when Jesus was still walking the earth, right? Mm -hmm. Well, and, and on your point of, of fatherlessness, which is an issue that we're dealing with greatly right now, they have found, and I, I just saw the other day, I think it was on Twitter. Um, if you don't have a father, the men that or boys that don't have a father growing up have twice, they're, they're twice the rate of, you know, poverty and jail time, incarceration, mm. all that kind of stuff, you know, and that's a huge difference. Yes. But there's been studies that show that those can be mitigated. All those issues can be almost completely mitigated if those boys, when they're growing up, are in a community where there are men. Where those men, you know, th th they're not all trying to be your dad. Right. They're not all trying to step in like that, but they're just around you and they are willing, you know, you're around them and they're willing to call you out and, and that, they're willing to be there. I for mean, you. that was my youth leader growing up. He yeah. taught me how to shave and he also was my youth leader. So he was also yeah. walking me through spiritual things. Yeah. There was older men who took me out hunting, but also talked to me about how, you know, the world works or what I should be looking for in life and things of these natures. So it's like, that only existed because my grandma made it a priority to make sure me and my siblings went to church. So my larger community as a whole stepped into these key moments in my mm -hmm. life and said, Hey, I'm going to help teach you because no one else is around to yeah. do so. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and what, dis one of the things that you just mentioned about discipleship, that's amazing is it creates a larger community mm. because when you, you know, we all have our own little communities. We have our friend groups. We have people who are around, we have our coworkers. You know, if you go to church every Sunday, there's probably a place you sit. There's probably people you see that you tend to talk to right. that kind of stuff. Right. Like at Foothills, we've got, you know, what's our average attendance on a Sunday around a thousand in person or is it, uh, little... we're about 800 during the summer. So. Okay. So during the summer, we've got about 800 people there. I don't know all 800 of those people. You don't know all 800 no, of those people. For sure not. And I don't think anybody does. And so they, you, when you come to church, if you're coming up physically to Foothills on a Sunday, there's probably a couple of people you know that you're talking to, right? And you're yes. not talking to everybody. You're talking to those specific people. But we all have those groups. And when you find someone to disciple you, and when you find someone to disciple, those groups come together. And mm -hmm. you start to network. And we're not all great networkers. And I know some of us are introverts, and they don't, you know, not quite as talkative. And that's okay. You know, you know, you're, you don't have to have some massive social circle, but there becomes this interconnectedness and that can create a larger community and a larger community is what will solve almost every single one of the issues we're seeing in our cities and our states and in our countries today. So you're saying that this idea of discipleship and community will solve a lot of the yes. problems that we're seeing propagate up throughout the world today that are yeah well and especially in our country like i look at i see so many issues and i see that you know the political solutions to them and i'm like cool i'm glad you're trying to come up with a political solution but that's never going to fix the problem because 95 percent of the problems that we see in our country would be fixed with people plugged into community mm. when we look at acts chapter four the last part of of the chapter we see a church and it describes it the believers shared with each other. They shared everything. No one was in need because of it, you know, and this was, now we have a middle class and right. much more than Rome did. And so there's a lot fewer people in need today than there were in Rome. <laughs> there are many, many fewer people, but even back then with the, with, with how many people were in need and how many people needed help to get by, whether with medicine or anything, or just with food with the, again, the need was greater back then 
yet the church provided everything because they all shared their property as needed. You know, it says if someone was in great need, someone who had a field would sell it so they could provide for those needs. Absolutely. And, and look, there's, there's a worry and, and I understand, you know, I've grown up in Idaho, which is very, very conservative and the conservative ideas that I've heard growing up, you know, if you see someone who's homeless, it's not always helpful to give them money mm -hmm. because, you know, you don't know how we'll spend it and all this stuff about responsibility. And I think, you know, whatever your position is on that, I do think there are some points there, but if that person's in your community and you have a relationship with them and you know them, then you know how you can help. You know right. what it is they need that you, you know why they're in need and what other, cause a lot of the time monetary need is a symptom of something else, right? Yes, absolutely. And so you understand I can help them monetarily this way, but this is the real problem because you're in community. And that is what the first century church did. And that is how they eliminated poverty among the church. Well, and we see that in the way we do outreach here. Cynthia runs a great pantry and exactly. outreach program that does ministry to people that are mm -hmm. on hard times that are needing assistance. My yeah. grandma, her, she would constantly stop to help people, but she never gave them cash. She said, mm -hmm. I can take you to a place where you can work, or I can take you to a place and go buy you food. And it was never just a straight yeah. uh, handout where it, if she didn't know them, she didn't know what they were going to do with it. She said, okay, well, what do you need? And we will yeah. go get it together. Right. Yeah. And so I think in a larger sense, these, these issues that we're seeing that if we were to come together in community, there would be a lot more ability to dial in on what in a person who is down on their luck actually needs yes. besides just fixing a mm -hmm. symptom or a temporary band-aid for mm -hmm. something that's a much larger issue. And on top yes. of that, I think being in community, being in small groups and, and discipleship, it forces you to talk about differing views, right? Like mm -hmm. these ideas of how do we help people who are down on their luck? you learn to talk to someone and have maybe a different opinion and mm. still walk away going, okay, we talked about it. I don't completely agree with them, but I see their point and I can move forward. And I think that's one of our biggest issues these days in America is the bifurcation of people where mm -hmm. it's like, okay, there's one thing you said that I don't like. So now you are dead to me and I can't listen to anything you ever say ever again. Mm -hmm. And the, the ability to have a discussion and grow and learn from each other has basically all but disappeared. It's, I only want to hear what I want to hear. And if you say something I don't want to hear, then just yeah. stop talking. And community helps so much, like you said, because you, you know, uh, one of my favorite things is, you know, sometimes on Twitter, you'll see someone, you know, post about their view of the other side. And it's so, so distorted. It's just because a lot of times people do not talk to people that don't share their opinions. But one thing that's amazing about the church is the church started as a, a diverse movement and mm. it still is a diverse, it's still supposed to be a diverse movement at least. And we want to have people with different opinions and different ideas and different thoughts. And then we come together as a community and that community starts with discipleship. You know, we start by discipling others and by being discipled ourselves because we're learning and we're growing in Christ. Our personal relationship with Christ is growing. And out of that, we can build a community. We can know more and more people. One person who's amazing at this is Pastor Harv. Pastor Harv is like the ultimate networker. I think he probably knows everyone in the world or at least someone in like every Feels country like it, or something. Right? It really does. And so whenever I have gone to Harvey and I need help with something or I have a question, you know, either he can answer or he's like, oh, I know these three people who could help you out. Right. Like he is so, so good at that. And that's an amazing thing. And again, we don't all have to have that kind of network. We don't all have to be that good at that. You know, that's something that is a gift of Harvey's and that's amazing, but we can have that on a smaller scale and we should community will solve so, so many of our problems. And the way we build a strong community is by starting with that one-on-one -on -one discipleship, that small groups where you only have a couple of people. So you get to know them better. Mm -hmm. And then one thing that's great, you know, when we were on the men's retreat a couple of weeks ago or a month ago, I don't, you know, time is no context time, in my yeah. idea anymore. So, <laughs> so whatever it was, but it was earlier this year. And when we were on the men's retreat, there are a bunch of guys that I don't know up there, but I kind of know a little bit because of the people I know that know them. So again, Harvey runs a ton of small groups. Mm -hmm. So there's a bunch of guys that I kind of know a little bit, because Harvey is in a small group with them, but it's great because I can have a conversation with them. I can relate to them. I can see how they're doing. And I have a little bit of a connection, even though I never ever see them besides on a men's retreat or occasionally at church. And that's a great thing because it brings us together. There's that second level of connectedness where even people don't know super well, we know someone who does. 
and it brings us together a little bit and it allows us to build more and more community. And that is a great thing because again, I want to keep saying this community can solve so many of our issues and the way it solves our issues is we bring more people into it. You know, people that maybe are, are struggling with something. We invite them into our community and we help them. We try mm -hmm. to aid them. We try to help them with their difficulties. Like we talked about earlier, we try to help them with the symptom, which is usually a money thing. And then we try to help with the actual cause of that and say, hey, how can we help with this too? And then as a community, we care about each other. We love each other. We work for each other. And that is why a community is so important. It can, it can help solve so many of our problems if we are committed to it. And that is the last little piece of what we're going to talk about on Sunday and what Philippians says and what, you know, Top Gun is about is when you get to the very end, you have to support that community and you have to work towards it. It doesn't just happen. You know, we see in Top Gun, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen it, it's 37 years old. Your uh, fault. <laughs> yeah, your fault. <laughs> Goose passes away. And that shock really rocks Maverick. But what does he turn to? He turns to Viper, his instructor. And the other guys around him in Top Gun support him, you mm -hmm. know, and want him to help. And the other guys in the military, you know, his commanding officer back on the aircraft carrier trusts him. And Iceman is like, no, 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 do not send him up as my backup. And the commander's like, tough luck. I know what you're going to say. I'm doing it anyway. Mm -hmm. He has this community that supports him and builds him up. And then he's able to step forward because of it. And that is an awesome and amazing thing. And that is what you have to, but you have to intentionally do that. It doesn't just happen. And that is where our conduct comes into view. Are you trying to disciple someone? Are you seeking someone to disciple you? Are you involved in a small group? Are you involved in a larger, bigger community? Because those are four things that are so, so important that we are called to do as Christians. You know, if, if you're not a Christian, then it's an amazing process and it's an amazing thing. And I'd encourage you to look into it. Because I think you'll find that it's such a life-changing, affirming, and powerful thing for each of us to do. And if you are a Christian, and if you agree with Jesus' words about discipling, then I don't see why you shouldn't do this. You know, we say, oh, we don't have enough time, or we can't afford to do it, or whatever. But or we I can't don't do know it. how. Yeah, and oh, so that's a huge one. There's two, two big ones that I do want to talk about before we finish up. I don't know how, or, and this I, I've seen this happen to other people, they'll pour into somebody. And then what do people do? People are filled with what? They're filled with sin. Yes. We are messed up. We are messy. We are I'm messy. People. Jesse's messy. Everyone listening. Um, you're messy. You're Sorry. messed up. We have Spoiler brokenness. Alert. You're messy. And so what happens if you have a relationship with somebody? What inevitably happens? Something happens. Something that, uh, happens get, that's bad. Yes. Right? There's conflict. And sometimes someone may just flat out betray you. You know, I've seen this happen in churches before where, you know, it causes a lot of drama. It causes a lot of pain and hurt, but someone just decides to betray someone else. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they become selfish and they try to take something for theirs. And sometimes it's resolved. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes they just leave, right. you know, and they hurt somebody and leave. But that's never a reason not to do it. Mm. I'd like to point out that Jesus had how many disciples for years? Twelve. Twelve main disciples. What's one of the most famous after Peter, after John, who's one of the a most little, famous little guy named probably Judas. Judas. Would be my guess. <laughs> yeah. And, and we see throughout scripture, Jesus knew Judas was going to betray him. And yet, and yet he poured into him for three years, right? Mm. He poured into him for years. He gave him the treasury. You know, he, he, he elevated Judas in so many ways. He never like put him off to the side and he's like, I know what you're going to do. Yeah. So we're just going to keep you over here. You have to do it, but we need you for this plan to work, but we're going to, no, he treated him just as he treated everybody mm. else. He cared for the, him. He loved him, even though he knew Judas was going to betray him and lead him to the cross. And we are called to be Christ-like, and that's not fun always, and it can suck sometimes, but in discipleship, we're going to experience pain because we're building relationships with others. Within a church, within a small group, we're going to experience pain. So talk to me about, for those who are worried about, they don't know how. Can yeah, you so have let's, any tips let's on focus that? on that last one. For those who don't know how, on Sunday, uh, I've already asked Pastor Doug to put so together some discipleship materials that I can point people to on Sunday. Uh, maybe we can update the show notes uh, with those yes. resources. And the best way to learn how, and this is just, so this is a, a, a personality trait of me. It may not be everybody else out there. <laughs> the best way to learn how is just to jump in and do it, right? I think that <laughs> inevitably you're never going to be perfectly prepared exactly. to do Exactly, at some point. You know, and if you don't know how, 
then seek out somebody that you believe is wise and knowledgeable in their walk with Christ. Not just someone who's wise and knowledgeable in general about the world, but someone who's known Christ for years that you trust and you feel confidence in. And maybe you don't even know them super well, but you've seen them around and you've seen what they've done. And you're like, you know what, that person, I trust the relationship with God and talk to them about it. And if, if you think it's right, again, prayer is also a huge part of this, you know, pray, ask for God's guidance and maybe it'll be somebody you don't know very well. And that may be a little scary, but talk to them about it anyway. If God is leading you that way, do it and talk to someone who could disciple you and then learn from that. Uh, the, the guys that I disciple, I always tell them, you know, after a certain amount of time, I'm going to tell you to go out and do this. Mm. You know, I give them a little bit of a grace period of six months to a year and say, Hey, let's meet up. I want to pour into you. I want to help you. Um, one of the guys I was doing, he was involved in like school and working. And so he was so, so busy. So I was like, we're not going to have you disciple yet because you're in this short term period where you're just super, super busy. It was like, but once that's over, once you're out of school, you're going to have more time. And then it's important Mm. to go and disciple because I will have poured into you for months and I want to keep doing that, but it's going to be time for you to go find other people to disciple. And that's how we grow. And that's how we grow community because then he'll go disciple people. And then those people will disciple people. And again, there's going to, there's a lot of pain in it. And there's a lot of times it doesn't work out. And there's a lot of times you'll offer people and they'll say no, or you'll do it for a little bit, but you can tell they're not really, you know, it committed and then they'll, they'll they'll say they want to stop and stuff and that happens and it's not fun, but it's okay. And we have to keep moving forward and we keep doing it because that's what Jesus calls us to do. Absolutely. Well, I, do you have any final thoughts as we're wrapping up today on discipleship or maybe concerns that people might have going into it, things of that nature? Well, if you have concerns, I understand. And I would say maybe start by asking someone else to disciple you. Maybe that's your first, because because there's four things, remember, that we talked about. Yes. The first is being discipled. The second is discipling someone else. The third is being in a small group. And the fourth is being part of a larger community, which mm-hmm. if you're in Boise, we would encourage you to be in Foothills. If you're online with Boise, that's great. But I also encourage you to find you know, a larger community somewhere where you can be part of that. Or if, you know, if you watch Foothills online and you love it, then visit Boise occasionally, you know, yeah. and try to make sure because it's part of your or church. Or engage in the, the chat that's in engage some in of the, the chat. online and, options. And you know, build that larger community. We've got a couple of volunteers that are in the chat room every week mm-hmm. and they sit there and they start to recognize people and they're like, hey, yeah. so-and-so's here and hey, so-and-so's here. It's like, maybe that's part of it that you start that's off with. That's a great right? way to have a larger community. It's different, but that might be the way you have to engage for now and then you find some other option later. Yeah. But I would encourage everyone who's listening, if, if you're not a Christian, then I understand, but, but kind of think about this and, and let this be something that is curious to you about how Christianity is supposed to work with this weird discipleship thing and all that stuff. Uh, and if you are someone who follows Christ, then listen to his words. And those are the four things we need. Are you being discipled? If you're not, that one's pretty easy. You find someone that you trust that you know has followed God for a while that has, I would encourage you to find someone who has good standing in a church or Mm -hmm. something like that, because you know that if the church trusts them, there's probably a good amount, you know, there's probably a reason for that. Um, The second thing is finding a small group. You know, finding a small group is also an easier one because there's at Foothills, we have a ton of groups going on. Uh, You know, there's, they're they're on the website. You can talk to people at church about them. And small group doesn't always look like going and sitting in a house and reading the Bible. Like we've got a, a, a small group of guys that they go out shooting. Yeah. Together. And they, they talk about spiritual things. They talk about life, but it's not this thing where it's just them sitting. Yeah. And doing, they're doing stuff. They're, they're having stuff a good together. time. Yeah. They're doing life together. And along the way, they're encouraging and growing together and going, yes. Oh, you know, things are kind of hard at home right now. Oh, well let's, let's look at some scripture about let's what we're about supposed that. to do, or let's this is what out. worked for yeah. me, you know? And we, I know pastor Harv has several groups that don't, aren't even necessarily technically Bible study groups. Mm-hmm. They're just groups of men that he's starting to kind of invite and slowly kind of inviting them to start being part of a church. They're not, they're kind of skeptical of the church thing. And so he's like, well, let's not do the church thing to start. Let's just get together Mm -hmm. and we'll talk about life together, not in a church setting. And then if you feel led or if you start having questions about like, well, it seems like you've got something that I don't, then we can move on to those next steps. Mm -hmm. So it's not always going to be when you hear the word small group, it always feels like, okay, we got to go and sit and study 
you know, yeah. a book of the Bible every week. And it's like that thing. It looks very different for different people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's a great point. You know, there's a ton of different small groups. There's a ton of different ways to do it. And I would say the most important one is to start doing one. If yes. you're involved in one, great. If you're not, search for that. If you're involved in a church in a larger community, and we hope you're involved in Foothills, great. If you're not, start doing that. Mm. If you're not being discipled, find someone to pray about it, figure that out. And if you're not discipling anybody, maybe it's not quite time, but I will say this within six months to a year, if you start getting after it, start being discipled and being involved with from six months to a year, you'll be able to start discipling. Mm. And I know it can be scary, but this is what Jesus has called us to do. When he calls us to do something, no excuses. It's a good thing. This is a gift from God. The fact that we can have a church, the fact that we can have a community, the fact that we can have discipleship with each other because we'll grow closer to him and our community should, if we're doing it right, solve problems, solve problems in people's lives, solve problems in our larger community because of who we are and how things are going and how we act and behave. And that is the goal. So those are the four things. Everyone should come away remembering the four things from this being discipled, discipling others, being part of a small group and being part of a larger church community. All four of those. If you are a follower of Christ, you should be doing all four. And if you're not, that is the conduct that Paul is talking about. Do not become an enemy of God by your conduct. Mm -hmm. Become a follower. Push his kingdom forward with those four things. It's something that you can't afford not to do. You cannot take enough time to do those things. I know you have other important things in your life, but those four things are so critically important in building a community and building a church and in building your own relationship with Christ. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Zach, for sharing with us. I really appreciate your insight. And I know all of our listeners um, also appreciate the practicality of the steps you gave us. I mean, it's always nice to have a list. It's, you know, sometimes we're looking for just a checklist of things that we can do to make those next steps. And you've given us four great ones to move forward in our walk. So make sure you guys tune in next or on Sunday to listen to Zach talk more about this, expand on it a little bit more and to uh, chat a little bit more about Top Gun. But ultimately we're here to study the Bible and learn more and grow in our faith. So thank you guys so much for joining us and we'll see you on Sunday here at Foothills.